Section 2 of Christmas and Christmas Lore. This is a LibreVox recording. All LibreVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibreVox.org. Recording by Julie Burks. Christmas and Christmas Lore by Thomas G. Crippen. Section 2 Origins of Christmas. Our topic is old Christmas customs and traditions, and the difficulty is where to begin. Perhaps it is best to begin at the beginning and ask, where did Christmas come from? Not from what secret recess did that hale and frosty giant emerge, with his jovial face and holly crown and steaming bowl, who smiles upon us from ten thousand pictures, and whom we instinctively recognize as Father Christmas. But how did the fashion arise of celebrating the birthday of our Lord on the 25th of December, not only with religious observances, but with feasting and jollity? For there is no record, nor even any respectable tradition, of the actual date of our Savior's birth. Even the year is not absolutely certain. It is generally agreed that the traditional date, AUC 753, Footnote 1. Anno Urbis Condite, 753, equals the 753rd year from the building of the city, i.e. Rome, is too late, for St. Matthew distinctly affirms that Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, and Herod died in AUC 750. There must have been time between the birth of Jesus and the death of Herod, for the visit of the wise men from the east, the retreat into Egypt, and the slaughter of the innocents. The testimony of St. Luke is by no means as decisive as at first glance it seems to be. For one thing, the real meaning of his remark about the census, chapter 2, verse 2, is very doubtful. Then it is uncertain whether the fifteenth year of Tiberius Caesar, chapter 3, verse 1, is counted from AUC 765, when he was associated with Augustus in the empire, or from the death of Augustus in AUC 767. Then the phrase, about thirty years old, in chapter 3, verse 23, may mean anything from 29 to 31, so that Luke's indications of the year of the nativity are not more definite than about AUC 749 to 753. Nor does St. Matthew help us much by his account of the star, first seen in the east and then over Bethlehem. There is indeed no necessity to understand this as denoting either a new star or such a conjunction of two or more stars as would make them seem to coalesce, or a mere atmospheric meteor. The most likely meaning of his star is some such celestial phenomenon as, interpreted by astrological rules, would indicate the birth in Judea of someone destined to greatness. Now, there was a remarkable conjunction of two planets in May, again in October, and yet again in November AUC 747, which astrologers would certainly think portended some great thing about to happen. We are nowhere told that Jesus was born exactly at the time when the star appeared, but it seems safe to conclude that his birth was at some time between the middle of AUC 747 and the end of AUC 749, i.e. 7 BC and 5 BC. This agrees with a very ancient tradition that, when our Lord was born, the temple, more correctly gate, of Janus at Rome was shut, in token of peace throughout the whole Roman dominion. Such an event had only occurred twice before the reign of Augustus, but it happened in AUC 724 and again in AUC 746, from which time the gate remained closed for several years. No war or battle sound was heard the world around. The idle spear and shield were high up hung, the hooked chariot stood unstained with hostile blood. The trumpet spake not to the armed throng, and kings sat still with awful eye, as if they surely knew their sovereign lord was by. 
If the year of our Savior's birth is thus open to question, the day is yet more uncertain. The days of his death and resurrection are clearly recorded in the Gospels, and from the time of the Apostles until now, the anniversary of his resurrection victory has been almost universally observed. The birthday of the Church, too, the day of Pentecost, was fixed by the Jewish calendar, and from almost the earliest ages it has been kept as a joyful Christian anniversary. Very early, too, it became usual to consecrate the new year to him in whom all things become new, by a festival which was designed to commemorate at once his manifestation, his baptism, and his first miracle. But not until the third century do we find any attempt to fix with authority the day of his birth. There are indeed vague traditions of a festival of the Nativity kept at Rome in the time of Bishop Telesphorus between A.D. 127 and 139, and some of the Christmas observances of the Roman Church are said to be of his appointment. There is a story of a massacre of Christians in the catacombs on the day of the Nativity in some unspecified year between A.D. 161 and 180, and a similar story of a massacre at Nicomedia in the reign of Diocletian about A.D. 300, but all these stories are too vague, and the earliest mention of them too late to be at all reliable. There was a common belief that the nativity took place on the 25th day of the month, but which month was quite uncertain, and there was scarcely a month in the year to which some guesser did not assign it. Clement of Alexandria, before 220, names five dates in three different months of the Egyptian year to which various persons assigned the nativity, and one of these corresponds to the 25th of December. There was, in the third century, a common belief that our Lord was born on the day of the winter solstice. This does not seem to have rested on any record or evidence worth the name, but on a fantastic interpretation of some prophetic scriptures, also on a notion that the Annunciation and the Crucifixion were both on the same day of the year, viz. the 25th of March. The apocryphal book called The Apostolic Constitutions, written probably towards the end of the 3rd century, represents the apostles as ordaining that the feast should be kept on the 25th day of the ninth month, by which, however, the context clearly shows that December is meant. The learned John Selden, in his treatise in defense of the traditional date, published posthumously in 1661, affirms that in the early Christian ages the solstice was supposed to fall on the 8th of the calends of January, that is, the 25th of December. This date, however, has not found universal acceptance. A document assigned to about A.D. 243 gives 28th March as the date of the Nativity, and several modern students infer from the mention of shepherds abiding in the field and from arrangements presumed to have been necessary for the census, that it must have been some time between the end of July and the end of October. Soon after the end of the last great persecution, between A.D. 310 and 320, or as others say, about 336, the Church at Rome definitely fixed on the 25th December as the birthday of the Lord, the Manifestation, i.e., the visit of the wise men from the east being celebrated twelve days later. For a couple of generations, the Eastern Church continued to make the Epiphany Festival on 6th January include the commemoration of the Holy Birth, but early in the 5th century the Roman use became almost universal. Footnote 1. Traditions vary greatly as to the time when the Roman usage was generally accepted in the East. By one account, it was the result of a consultation between Pope Julius I and Bishop Cyril of Jerusalem about A.D. 352. Others mention 375 for Antioch and 385 for Jerusalem, while yet another tradition ascribes the adoption of the Western date at Jerusalem 
to Bishop Juvenalius about 431. There was much to commend this selection of a date. So long as heathenism was in full vigor, the ancient Christians were puritanically jealous of anything that might seem like coquetting with idolatry. But when heathenism was manifestly declining, there was a disposition to adopt such of its usages as were harmless and capable of a Christian interpretation. And it is not easy to blame this disposition, as the Christ child coming into the world transfigured it, so that from the day of his advent it was the same and yet not the same. So the old observances, when associated with the memory of his coming, were animated with new spirit, and what was heathenish became rich with Christian symbolism. Now in December and the beginning of January, there were several festivals which were intimately associated with the daily life of the Roman people. First, from the 17th to the 21st December, was the Saturnalia, the great Roman holiday in remembrance of the supposed Golden Age. One might call it the Feast of Topsy Turvydom, when slaves were allowed for a few days to enjoy the semblance of freedom, were waited upon by their masters, and chose from among themselves a mock king to preside over their revels. Next, on the 22nd, came Sigloria, the Feast of Dolls, when a fair was held and dolls and other toys, mostly of earthenware, were given to children. Then, on 25th, came Brumalia, otherwise Dies Natalis Invicti Solis, the birthday of the unconquered sun, when the days began to lengthen after the solstice. This was neither ancient nor very popular. It is believed to have been instituted as late as A.D. 270 or 273 by the Emperor Aurelian in honor of Mithras, the Persian sun-god of which he was an ardent worshipper. It is worth mentioning here that, of all the new religions which sprang up during the decline of the Roman Empire, Mithraism was the purest in its morality and the only one which came into serious competition with Christianity. Finally came Calinde Genuari, the New Year's Day, when everybody gave gifts to everybody else, strinae they were called, connected with which was Juvenalia, the special festival of childhood and youth. Surely it was well that all these should be combined into one great Christian festival and their ancient significance transfigured in the light of the gospel, so that instead of the old Saturnalia celebrating the vague tradition of a golden age forever past, this feast should celebrate the sure and certain hope of a golden age that shall never end. It should afford not a transient and mocking image of freedom, but a pledge of that liberty wherewith the truth makes free indeed. And so ere long all Latin-speaking Christendom was joyously singing, Oh, the ever-blessed birthday, when the Virgin full of grace, by the Holy Ghost conceiving, bear the Savior of our race. And the child, the world's Redeemer, first displayed his sacred face, evermore and evermore. End of section 2